So as most of you know, today we are wrapping up a four-week series that we've been in entitled My Story. And uh, for those of you who maybe have missed some of the previous weeks, what, what I'd like to do is just take a few moments to kind of bring you up to speed with where we are. Okay, here's the idea. Here's what we've been talking about, or here's the, the thought that we've been embracing. We've been embracing this idea that every single one of us is creating our own story. L- literally, the decisions that we make, the choices that we choose, the, those things, we are literally writing our own story. Now, the good news is this. Some of us, we're, we're going to have portions of our story that we're proud of. We're going to have good stories to tell, right? Maybe it's a time that we ventured out and, and did something that was kind of outside of our comfort zone, but we ended up making some new friends, and so we're better for that. Or, or maybe it's a decision that we made to start a discipline in our life that, that changed the direction of our life. We're, we're going to have good stories to tell, many of us. Unfortunately, some of us are going to have stories that we're not so proud of, right? Maybe, maybe stories that we hope that no one will ever know. Maybe some regrets that we have or some decisions that we wish that we could kind of do over. The, the reality is, the truth is, every single one of us, we're writing our own story. The, the choice is really up to us in the story that we will write. Because as we talked about and we've been talking about this entire series, the key thought, if you're taking notes, you can write this down, is this. The decisions that we make today determine the stories that we will tell tomorrow, right? The, the decisions that we make today, the decisions we're making right now, they, they, they determine the stories that we're going to tell tomorrow, just like the decisions we made yesterday are determining or, 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 the, or the stories that we're telling today. And so for many of us, we, as we kind of have talked through this, we've been looking at different aspects of what that means for our lives. And today I want to kind of look at, at a different aspect of that because for some of you, maybe you're at a point in your life right now where you feel like God is calling you or God is inspiring you or, or, or God is, is, is kind of pushing you into something new. Maybe he's calling you to start something that you don't even know where it is or what it is, but you just feel like God is calling you to step out and to, to venture out in that. Well, if that's where you are, or maybe you're not there now, but one day you will be, here's another key thought that I want us to consider under that umbrella of the decisions we make today determine the stories we tell tomorrow. The, the key thought would be this for today, if you're taking notes. Sometimes... The best decision you can make is to go when it would be easier to stay. Sometimes the best decision you can make is to venture out, to to take the step of faith, to, to go when everything in you says the easiest thing to do would be to play it safe. So see, in this series, we've been kind of considering the bigger picture of life, and, and we've been talking about it this way. We've been asking a question, what is the story that you want to tell with your life? Or how do you live the story that God wants you to tell? Or how do you live a story worth telling? And we've been answering that question fr- from a very key passage of Scripture, Hebrews chapter 12 in verse 2. If you know it, you can say it with me, but he- here's what we've been looking at. The verse says, let us fix our eyes on Jesus the author and the perfecter of our faith. See, the question is, how, how do you live a story that, that, that God wants you to tell? How do you live a story worth telling? Well, if you want to do that, guess who you want to have with you? You, you want to have Jesus, right? The, the author and the perfecter of your faith, helping you to, to make the right decisions, helping you to live the life that God has called you to live. In fact, in this series, we've been doing that. We've been looking at making four decisions. If you remember, week number one, we made the decision to start. We said, what is the one thing that we need to start, that, that we need to start or implement in our life so that we can tell the story that God wants us to tell Week number two, we made the decision to stop. What, what is the one thing that we need to stop or, or the one thing that, that's hindering us from telling the story that God wants us to tell that we need to stop? Week number three, we, we made the decision to stay when it would be easier to go because sometimes God is going to call you to just grow where you're planted. Today, though, what I want us to consider is this question, okay? We're going to seek God and we're going to ask him where or when do you want us to go? Where, where do you want us to go? What do you want us to do when it would be easier to stay? We're going we're gonna to make the decision to go when it would be easier to stay. Now, a great example of what I'm talking about here is found in the Old Testament story of Abram and Sarai. Now, those of you that are kind of church people or, or you're familiar with your Bible you, know, Bible, you know that Abram and Sarai eventually became Abraham and Sarah, okay? But before that happened... The, the backstory on Abram and Sarai is this, okay? Abram w- was one time worshiping this false god by the name of Nanar. 
Now, now for those of you that are kind of my age and older, that you just feel compelled right now to go nanar, nanar, you, you, you can just go ahead and do that, okay? You, you just, feel, just go for it, all right? The rest of you that are kind of younger than me, and you're kind of going, what is that? Don't worry about it. It was a bad era, but we loved it, okay? At, at any rate, okay, here, here's where it is. You, you have Abram, and he's worshiping this false god named Nanar, okay? He's in the Ur of the Chaldees at this time, and one day God comes to him, and, and, and the one true God gives him this very simple but very direct command. We, we, look at, we pick up with the story, Genesis chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. Here's what scripture says. The Lord said to Abram, what? Would you say that word with me? Leave your country, your people, and your father's house, and what? Say it with me. And go to the land I will show you. W what is he saying? He's saying, leave where you are and go, right? Leave and go. Leave and, and go. Now, I'm going to say something that's probably pretty obvious to all of you, but I'm going to say it anyways, okay? H here's the deal. In order to go somewhere, you have to leave where you are. Most profound truth that you'll hear all day long, right? But, but, but in order to, to go somewhere, you're going to have to leave what's familiar. You're going to have to leave what's maybe comfortable. You might have to leave what you know. If you need milk, you might have to leave the comfort of your fluffy couch and go to the grocery store to get milk. You get the idea, right? You're, you have to leave where you are in order to go somewhere. But I like to say it this way maybe to put a little bit more of a spiritual spin on it, I like to say it this way. In order for you and I to step into our destiny, we have to walk away from our security. Now, that's better preaching than you're responding to. So you're being really quiet. So I'm just going to say that again because I want to hear it, okay? So I'll just give myself a little amen. But, but here's the deal, all right? If we're going to step into what God has for us, if we're going to step into our destiny, we have to be willing to walk away from our security, right? This is, this is what God is calling Abram to do. I mean, think about it. This is the town that he was raised in, right? He was born and raised in the Ur of the Chaldees. And God's saying, I want you to leave where you are, and I want you to go somewhere else, right? I mean, think about what God's asking him to do. He's saying, you know, I want you to leave your family and your friends. I, I want you to leave the house that you're about to pay off, right? I, I want you to leave the neighborhood that you know, the, the, the community that you know that if, if you ever had kids, it would be a great school district, right? I mean, he's saying, I want you to leave that, that best friend that you've had since you were 12 years old. I, I, I want you to leave the barber that cuts your hair or the lack thereof. Right? But, but I want you to leave the mechanic that you know, that you can trust, that will change your oil. Right? I mean, he's, he, he's like, I'm calling you to leave where you are, your comfort zone, and I want you to go somewhere else. And the only thing that God gives Abram is a very simple promise. L look at verse 2 and verse 3 with me. Here's what scripture says. God says to Abram, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. He says, I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on the earth will be blessed through you, right? And, and here's what Abraham would have done. Abraham would have gone, huh? W what do you mean, God? I mean, I hear that you're saying this great nation is going to come through me. I hear that you're saying you're, saying you're going to give me all these kids, but, but God, maybe you forgot. I'm 75 years old. At this point in Abram's life, he was 75 years old, right? You can, you can kind of hear him giving the argument, God, I mean, you know, d don't misunderstand me. Sarai and I have had fun trying, but, but it doesn't look like it's going to happen, and, and I don't want to give that up, but, but like I don't see it happening, God. How can that be? How can this great nation come through me? My, my, my ship has sailed. Like it, it, it's too late for me, which raises an interesting point, right? And, and the point is simply this. I don't, I don't know if any of you have ever done this, but I know I have in my life. I've made promises to God. Maybe you have as well, right? You, you know how it is. Like, God, I promise if you help me pass this test, I promise I'll study for the next one, right? You, you know how it is, right? Or, or God, I, I, I promise if, if you just keep me out of prison, 
right? I promise I will never, ever do that again, right? Or as long as I don't get caught, God, I promise I'll never, ever do it. How many of you have made promises to God? Let me see your hands. The rest of you that don't have your hands raised, you're all lying. That's not who you are. It doesn't define you, but that's what you're doing, okay? But at any rate, like, like the reality is we've all made promises to God, but here's the important thought. You ready? Here's the important thought. This one's just for free. It's not in your talk notes. You can just kind of write it in the margin, okay? But, but here's the thing. We are not changed by the promises we make to God. We are changed by the promises God makes to us. I'm going to say that again because I want to make sure some of you get this because some of you need to hear this this morning. You are not changed by the promises you make to God. You are changed by his promises to you. You you look at Abram, right? God is calling him to leave and to go, and all he gives him is this simple little promise. And how does Abram respond? Look at verse 4. It says, so Abram, what? Say it with me. He left as the Lord told him. He left as the Lord told him. Now, I I want you to kind of pause there for a second, and I want you to really think about what's happening here. Because there's something powerful that's taking place. Okay, think, think about it like this. Think about what would have happened if Abram would have kind of reasoned the promise of God away. You know how it is, right? Sometimes in our life, God says, I give you this promise, and we kind of go, well, but, you know, God, you don't, you know, they can't really forgive me. Can I just tell you, God can forgive you, right? That's what the Bible says, that God's faithfulness is, is great. His, his mercies are new every morning, right? That, that, that Jesus came because he loved you. Some of you, maybe you're new to church. Let me just kind of put it out there, okay? Here's the deal. God loved you so much that he sent his one and only son to do for you what you could not do for yourself, The reality is we were lost in our sins and our transgressions, but Jesus came and paid the penalty of our sin. He paid the price so that you and I could stand before God righteous and holy and pure and clean. The Bible says that he was buried in the grave, but three days later he rose again, conquering sin, conquering death. You mind if I preach for a second? Conquering hell, conquering the grave, all so that he could establish a relationship with you and with me. And sometimes you go, oh, but God, you you can't possibly do that for me. Listen, God can forgive any sin that you have ever committed, any sin that you currently are committing, or any sin that you will commit. And I thank God for that because I needed forgiveness yesterday. I went to Kennywood (laughs) and I ate two orders of potato patch french fries with cheese and, and bacon and I needed to repent of gluttony And I'm telling you, God forgives, but the consequences are still very real this morning. (laughs) Just saying. At at any rate, (laughs) where was I? At at any rate, think about what would have happened if Abram would have kind of rationalized or or, or reasoned away the promises of God. Could you hear him? Oh, but God. I I mean, I know that you said you're giving me this land as my inheritance. I I know that that, that you're sending me here, but I've never heard of that place. I've never seen it, so I don't know. It may not be very safe or secure for me to go there. Or, or God, I know that you're promising me to, to, to have this great nation come from me, but, but God, I'm 75 years old, and it, it hasn't happened yet. It's probably not going to happen, right? Think, think about the consequences that Abram could have experienced in his life if he didn't have the faith to believe God and go. I, I mean, think about it, right? So many people today know God as the God of who? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, right? So many people to this day say he's the God. The the one true God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But but think about it. If if, if Abraham had kind of reasoned that away, there wouldn't have been an Isaac, right? There there wouldn't have been a Jacob. We we wouldn't know Abraham as the God, uh, God as the God of Abraham because he would have been back with Nanar, right? Nanar, Nanar. He'd have been doing that thing or whatever, right? But, but think about it, right? There are untold number of consequences that could have happened in Abram's life if he didn't have the faith to trust God and go. And what I'm trying to say is this. Some of you, God is calling you. You have a calling on your life. That there's a ministry that he wants to birth through you. There, there, there's somebody that you, he wants you to reach out to. There, there's something. I, I just believe this. Can I, can I just say it? I believe that God knows the plans that he has for us. 
Come on, somebody. Right? It's not just the plans that he has for me. It's not just the plans that he has for this church. God knows the plans that he has for each and every one of you, right? And and he might be birthing uh, something in your heart. and, and, And the reality is this. For you to go somewhere, you have to be willing to leave where you are. And think about it like this. Think about the blessings that you could be missing out on if you don't have the faith to believe God and go. See, sometimes the best decision you can make is to go when it would be easier to stay. Now, let's do this. Let's kind of take a step back from that idea. And let's kind of look at the whole thing from a bigger perspective. Because in this series, we've been considering this question as well. We've been considering the question, what does God want you to want? And the reality is this, I don't know where you are, but, and I don't know exactly what it would be for you, but I think all of us, if we could take a step back from our life and look at it from the big picture, I think all of us could acknowledge that there are things that could be better in our lives, right? I mean, there are things that could be improved, that there are things that, that, that God wants for our life that we probably should want and, and, and do want for our lives if we would allow him to, to improve those. I don't know what it would be for you. Maybe, maybe for some of you it's financial freedom. Maybe you're just bound by debt. You're in bondage to debt and God just wants to like, help you get free from that, making the right decisions so that you can, you can be a blessing with the resources that he's given you because, again, I'm just one who believes that God blesses us so that we can be a blessing, right? He, he didn't bless us so we could get, you know, just spiritually fat. He like blessed us so that we could help others, right? That that might be what it is for you. Or maybe some of you, God is calling you to get involved in a life group because you, you've been trying to do life on your own. Or, or maybe it's to reach out in somebody else's life and make a difference. Or I don't know, may, maybe it's just kind of spending more time with your family because maybe some of you were a little bit like me where I can tend to be a workaholic and, and I can just kind of focus on that, but I need to, to be there for my family as well. Or, or maybe, I don't know, maybe it's just to grow your spiritual man. I don't know what it is for you, but the question I'm asking you is what does God want you to want? And then here's the application question. Based on that, based on that, where do you need to go or what do you need to do so that you can have what God wants you to have? Think, think about it. Because for some of you, you, you don't know how significant that decision could be. You, you don't know what could change in your life if you would be willing to make the decision to go when it would be easier to stay. I'll give you some examples of what I'm talking about. Some of you have been sitting in your chairs with eager anticipation, wondering what is this big announcement thing? You know, you've been talking about this big announcement, and I'm curious, I wanna know what it is, and, and as you kind of have figured out, it's not that I'm leaving. I don't know who started that rumor, but I'm gonna give you props, that was a great try. It was a great try. But, but, you know, I think we beat you on that. At any rate, here, here's the big deal. I want to kind of start from the beginning, okay? Some of you know this about my story. Some of you don't. But when I was in high school, I really felt like God called me into the ministry, okay? And, and for some reasons, I grew up in a pastor's home, and some of the experiences that I experienced in church, I was kind of like, ah, oh, God, I think you called the wrong guy. You know, you, I'm not the right guy for this. I don't want to do that. In fact, m- many of the ways that we do ministry or many of the reasons why we do ministry the way that we do is because of some of the bad experiences that I had, okay? But, but here was the deal. When, when God called me in the ministry, because there was some reluctancy, kind of did my, little own, my own little Jonah thing. For some of you who know the Bible story of Jonah, if not, read your Bible. It's really good for you. At any rate, um, I, I'm like, I had this kind of moment with God where I said, God, if you want me to be in the ministry, if you want me to be a pastor, I'm going to kind of need something a little more, I'm going to need like maybe an audible voice or something. I'm just going to, I'm going to need to know from you. And listen, d- don't misunderstand me. I don't think God always works that way, but he is God, so he can do whatever he wants to do, okay? And that he knew what I needed. And so some of you know the story. I, I went to bed one night while I was in high school, had this dream. And in this dream, I was walking along a, a beach, okay? For me, heaven was a beach. should get that t-shirt. Heaven is a beach. At any rate, for those of you that are beach lovers, heaven's a beach. For those of you that aren't beach lovers, Take it up with God, okay? This is just how my dream was. At any rate, we're, we're lock, walking along the shore uh, of the beach, okay? And, and, and to my right, there was this presence, and, and, and this is a dream, of course, but I didn't know, I couldn't see who it was, but I just knew that it was God. It was Jesus with me, okay? On my right. On my left, th- there was all these people where the water was breaking into the shore. There was all these people that were wearing kind of dark black clothes, and they were weeping, and they were crying. Well, 
I, I was a church kid, and so I knew that the Bible says there is no weeping. There, there, there is no sadness in heaven. There, there, the, the, the Bible says that God wipes away every tear, right? So I was perplexed by this. I was, I was confused. And so in my, my, my naiveness, I turned to God, and I said, or turned to Jesus, and I said, why are these people crying? And he said, well, they're crying. They're weeping for their unsaved loved ones, those that, that they care about, those that they love, that don't know Jesus, they don't know me, down on earth. And so again, kind of in, in my naiveness, in my, in my kind of youngness, I just said, well, you're God. Why don't you do something about it? Kind of bold, I guess. But at any rate, in my dream, the present shifted from the side to in front of me and literally said these words, I've done my part. This is what I've called you to do. And I woke up and I knew that I knew that I knew that I was supposed to give my life to sharing the message of the love of Jesus Christ. And that's what my calling has been, that there are people who are hurting, that there are people who are lost, that there are people who don't know Jesus, that desperately, desperately, desperately need to know that there is a God that loves them, that there's a God that can forgive them of their sins, that there's a God that can wash away the past. You guys who know this, come on, give some praise to God, right? You wash away the past, that they can make you brand new, that with Christ, the old has gone and the new has come, that you are a new creation, that, that you were born fresh and new. That, 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 you know, like, here's the deal, religion. A lot of people think, well, it's all about religion. No, religion, it's not the gig, okay? It, 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 it might, it might make you nice, it might, but I'm telling you, Jesus will make you new. And whoever's in Christ is a new creation. He's brand new, right? And so my, my life calling has been to just share that love with others because I just believe that when people understand that God loves them, it changes everything. It changes everything. And so fast forward a little in my life, and this is going to be a long story that's going to turn out longer, but I have your attention and I have the mic, so you're staying. At any rate... Okay, but, but I, I fast forward a little bit, and, and I, we took our first youth pastor position in this little town called Moberly, Missouri, and we were there for several years, and the lead pastor resigned, and, and so we transitioned into a smaller town called Minear, Illinois, okay, and, and we youth pastored there for quite a while, and it was while we were there that God began to really kind of birth in our hearts this desire, or, or this calling, would be better put, to, to serve in, in kind of the lead pastor or whatever it's called, senior pastor, head pastor. There's so many titles for what I do, I don't even know. But like, like the head of a church, okay? And I'm going to be honest with you. There was some reluctancy there because the reality is this. I don't know if you know this or not, but kind of like when you're the lead pastor, the buck kind of stops with you. So like when you make decisions for the church, right, and people don't like it, and, and just in case you don't know, everybody has an opinion, and they're really good about making it known. At, at any rate, like like... So, you know, the, the decision rests on me, and when I make a decision that people don't like, they rarely get upset with the youth pastor. They rarely get upset with the children's pastor. They hardly never, hardly ever, ever hardly ever get upset with the, with the music pastor. He just has to sing, and they go, oh, that's so beautiful. At any rate, <laughs> just kidding, Mark. Love you, man. <laughs> At any rate... Right? They, they get upset with, with the lead pastor, right? And so I'm like, I don't know, God. Like, I don't know if I can handle this. And I've shared with you some of my insecurities and all that stuff. But at any rate, I felt like that was what God had called me to do. And so here's what happened. While we were serving in Illinois, we got this phone call from this amazing church. And I don't, I, I don't normally take a lot of time to brag, but I'm just going to brag for a few minutes on this little church on the north side called Evangel Assembly of God fantastic group of people. I'm telling you what, seriously, yeah, give yourself a hand, because here's the deal. You put up with this young buck that thought he knew a lot more than what he did, and, and, and yet God did some amazing things in our church. If I, could, if I could sit here, I could take all day to tell you the miracles, how God provided, how, how by logic, by human logic, it shouldn't have happened, but God did it, right? Just amazing, amazing things. Life's transformed. People change for the glory of God. And, and then about like the four and a half, five year mark, we found out that there was this other church that was looking for a pastor, right? This, this little church, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, called Ridgewood. And God did this amazing, amazing thing. God merged two congregations together, something that's almost never, ever heard of, okay? It, it almost never works, and, and, and people don't, I don't know why, but at any rate, God did it, right? He merged these two congregations together, and here's the beauty of it. We, in that single decision, became stronger together than we ever were apart, 
And as a result of that, amen, give God praise. As a result of that, we have been able to reach more people for Jesus Christ. As you look around, it's the, the services are fuller. There's, there's hardly any week that will buy that we aren't you know, above 200 people that come between the two services. Just amazing things that God has done, right? He, he's merged us together, and we did this like crazy. We started off crazy. Like, who starts off the first week, my first Sunday, with a series entitled, We Are Family, and we're jamming to the song, We Are Family, right? You know how it is. That's why I don't sing, because at any rate, like, but here's the thing. That set the tone for who we have become as a church, because we really are a family, right? Well, here's what happened since then, okay? Well, not since then, but a part of that. Some of you know this, some of you don't, but Evangel, when it was Evangel, they had the responsibility or, or the privilege of being a part of two church plants that really started through the biggest churches in this entire area. One was Allison Park, and one was South Hills Assembly, okay? They were a part of that. Now, some of you who know the history of Ridgewood know that Allison Park started Ridgewood, right? And so this beautiful thing happened of this DNA of starting churches and reaching people and, and trying to reach those who were hurting and lost, okay? And so the, the leadership of this church, we began to pray. We began to seek God and say, what do you have next for us? What do you want to do in us? Where do you want to, to move us? What direction are we supposed to go when it would be easier to stay? Well, as that was all kind of unfolding, we ran into this woman by the name of Beth. Beth Demert, I won't point her out because I don't want to embarrass her, but she's a part of this church and she's been coming here for quite some time. And, and, and she had transitioned out of a ministry that she was involved in. And, and she has a brother who, who owns several businesses. And, and he was in a group with a bunch of other businessmen. And they were doing this thing, reading this book called Crazy Love. Anybody ever heard of the book Crazy Love? It's a crazy book, okay? Hence the title, Crazy Love. At any rate, they, they felt inspired by God to start leveraging some of their businesses that they were making for profit for God's glory, right? And so th there was this little business called Perry Perk. Anybody ever heard of that place? Great cup of coffee. I'm just going to tell you, I know some of you work at Starbucks, so I'm not looking in your direction. But... <laughs> Great cup of coffee, just saying, okay? A at any rate, so, so God gave Beth this, this, this uh, coffee house that she turned into a nonprofit organization called Life Without Limit. Well, as that was kind of unfolding and as the remodeling was happening and, and the launch dates kind of came into place, Beth knew Pastor Mark and Jana from a previous experience where they led worship for them, and Beth really felt led by God to have them kind of do the grand opening music-wise for the, uh, the coffee house, okay? And so Beth contacted Pastor Mark, and Pastor Mark and Beth got together, and, and, and as they were kind of talking through things, Beth, Mark started to share with Beth some of this idea that we had in our heart uh, of trying to reach out and trying to reach more people for Jesus, and, and something that we've said so often around here is this, we will do anything short of sin to, le to reach people who are far from God. Do you believe that? Right? We believe that, right? We'll do anything. That it doesn't matter how it happens, it just matters that it happens, okay? We want to reach people for Jesus, and we'll do whatever it takes. And so Pastor Mark started sharing with Beth some of these ideas, and Beth and Pastor Mark start to get excited. They have this little, like, Holy Ghost revival service right there in the, in the coffee house, and, and Mark comes back, and, and, and he shares with the board what's kind of going on. And so we make this decision as a church board that we are going to seek out the opportunities to reach other people for Jesus Christ. We're going to do whatever means necessary, and we made this decision. We're only going to do it as God opens the doors because we just believe that we're not responsible for opening doors, that God is responsible for opening doors, and we step through doors when they open, and we stop stepping through them when they close. So we felt like this was an open door. So we started to kind of hatch this plan. What could that look like? What, what would that take, take place? And, and between some, some conversations, we decided, wouldn't it be cool? Right, Beth? Pretty cool. Now you know who she is because I just looked at her. I saw her. Sorry. But like, we, we thought, wouldn't it be cool to partner with Life Without Limit and let's have a Sunday morning streaming broadcast at the coffee house to reach people that that ministry is already reaching, to reach people that maybe would never step foot in church before or, or, or would never step in foot in church at all. And let's just kind of see what God could do with that, okay? So, so we, we kind of started thinking through that. And then we go, okay, well, here's a little problem. We've got the logistics. Where are we going to have the money to do that? How is that going to happen? 
It's a little expensive to purchase the technology. And, but, but we also believe that God owns the cattle on a thousand hills, that he's the one that holds all kinds of money. And so we also believe that we're not going to go in debt because God doesn't believe in debt. And so here's the deal. We just kind of say money follows vision. So we're just going to step out in faith, and we just believe that God was going to fund the, funnel the money. And so here's how that happened. We started looking, started doing some research. We've got some quotes on what it would ca- ta- cost to do this little thing called streaming. Some of you know that we record our service but streaming takes it to a whole nother level, okay? There's cost involved in that. And so we kind of got some quotes. And, and, and literally, literally, this is, this is the craziest thing. And, and I'm just going to tell you right now, I don't believe in co- coincidence with God. Okay? I believe that God orders our steps, that he knows and he ordains everything that is before us. He knows the plans he has for us. So I had quotes sitting on my desk. And, and this, this gentleman by the name of Paul Mulwinney and his wife they, they came up to me one Sunday morning, and I'm not going to point them out. I don't want to single them out either. But, but they came up to me one morning, and they said, hey, I, I have a question for you. We, we'd like to, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting when people come up to you and say, I have a question for you, okay? I'm just, I'm just going to preface this. And, and, and you never know what to expect <laughs> as a pastor, okay? I'm just going to tell you. Because here's what I've learned in, in, in about 15 years of doing this thing. Just when you think you know what's going to be asked, somebody comes up with something different. And then you're like, ah, oh, like I don't know the answer to that, right? But fortunately, Paul and Colette, they were like, no, we, 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 want, we, we want to make a donation to the church. And, and, but we want to kind of donate on, on something that's kind of fresh. Am I right, guys? Something new. Something at the ground level. And, and, and here's, here's Paul's exact words. Do you have anything that you've been thinking of? Do you have anything that, like, you haven't really been able to pull the trigger on because you don't have the finances? And I'm just like, well, <laughs> since you brought it up, right? And, and, and I just happen to have those quotes on my desk, and here's kind of how we do things. We always try to get four or more quotes, and we throw the, the most expensive one out, and we throw the least expensive one out, and we take the middle one, right? So I had this, these two middle quotes, and so I said to Paul, I said, well, he, here, here's the deal. Here, here's the quotes, and he looked at it, and he said, okay. And I think it was like two weeks later he came back and he handed me a check that allowed us to purchase everything in the first phase that we needed to purchase at no cost, extra cost to the church. Now here's what I'm going to tell you. That is not happenstance. That is God ordaining things. That is God directing our steps, okay? And so he, he, here's the deal. Uh, we don't exactly know when that's going to launch. Uh, there, there's some nuances and some things that you have to work out, but here's what I want you to understand. There's going to be some technology going in here, and I don't want you sitting there going, well, why are we purchasing that? We're purchasing it because the Paul Mulwiney family gave us the money to do it. So if you don't like what we do, take it up with him. He'll take care of my light work, (laughs) okay? (laughs) I'm just kidding. At any rate, I'm just teasing. But we're going to have some technology that's going into place, and that is going to be technology that we're going to be starting to put into place to be able to launch this satellite venue in partnership with Life Without Limit at the coffee house. But here is the beauty of this. This is the thing that just, this is just how God works, okay? This is what gets me jazzed. This is not just money for a one-time location. This technology gives us the option to be able to open up as many other remote locations as we possibly can or as much as we want to. It also allows us to stream our service live on the internet for those of you who might travel or people in other states that we know that have moved away but still want to stay connected with this church. This means that the possibilities are endless at what God could possibly do through the purchasing of this technology. Now, here, here's a little step of faith because we're not asking for any money. Some of you might be going, okay, where's the shoe going to fall? Where's the money? We're not asking for that because God has already provided that for us. What we're saying is this. If you'd like to partner with the church for the future, other locations, we don't know when that's going to happen. We don't know where it's going to happen, but if you'd like to partner with that, here's what I told first service. On your tithe envelopes, above and beyond your tithe, the tithe belongs to the Lord. We give that to him. That's how we support missionaries and works around the world. But your offerings, you can donate or you can designate to things. We, if you want to get involved in, in designating towards future campus development, I'm calling it spaces and places. It's a little catchy, I know. But, but like I'm calling it that because I'm just believing God's going to give us spaces and places. Okay, If he can give us a coffee shop, I had this thought the other day. And it's not really our coffee shop, it's Beth's coffee shop. But if he can open the door there, I had this thought the other day, that Jesus ministered to more people at the well than he did anywhere else, right? And I had this thought that coffee houses are modern day wells. 
Isn't that kind of cool? So we're just following the footsteps of our Savior, okay? But, but here's what I'm saying. If God can open the door at a coffee house, then maybe he can open the door at a bar that closed. Or maybe he can open the door at a strip club that closed. And some of you are going, whoa, 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 you just crossed the line, Heslop. Like strip club, listen, I believe that our God can redeem what the enemy means for harm. He can turn around and use it for good. So if he gives me a strip club, we're going to wash that thing down. We're going to paint that thing up. And we're going to make it beautiful. And we're going to show people the love of Jesus through a strip club, okay? Whatever he gives us. I'm not saying that's where we're going. I'm just saying, okay? I'm just saying, if he opens the door, whatever the space, whatever the place, I will stand and declare with every bound of strength that I have within these lungs, the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who loves and serves and desires a relationship with every man, woman, child, everyone on this earth, because he loves you more than you can possibly understand. Now, you might ask me, Chris, why are we going to all of that? Is, that? is that necessary? And my answer would be yes. It is necessary because here's the deal. I am not willing, under any circumstances, to miss out on the blessings that God has for us as a church corporately, the blessings that God has for you individually, the blessings that God has for me personally, because we refuse to go. I'm just one who believes that when we stand before Jesus, we're going to have a huge opportunity as we walk on this earth to reach as many people with the love of Jesus as possible. And one day we're going to be able to stand before Jesus. And I know if you're a man's man like me, this, is, this, is, this imagery is a little bit difficult. But the Bible says that we are the bride of Christ. And I know that doesn't make us men feel very like, whew, yes. He flex my guns. It's not, it doesn't make me feel that way. Okay, but, but the reality is this. Jesus is the bridegroom. And we have an opportunity, you want to have a cause worth living for, we have an opportunity to present the greatest gift ever to the bridegroom. And that is, these are the people who have come to know you because of the strength that you've given me and because you've used me to share your message. And I'm just telling you, I am not willing to miss out on that blessing. I am not willing to miss out on hearing my Savior say to this church, well done, my good and faithful servants. That's my hope. That's my prayer. Now, now, here's the deal. I don't want this to be all about what we're doing as a church, okay? And so I want to kind of kick it to you now as we close. And I want to ask you the question, what does God want you to want personally? What does God want you to want? And where do you need to go in order for you to experience what God wants you to want. I, I don't know what that's going to be for you. For some of you, maybe, maybe God is calling you to start a life group or, or to get involved in a life group. Maybe, maybe you've been trying to do life on your own and it's just not working and that's because we weren't created to be lone rangers. We weren't created to do life on our own. We were created to do life in relationship with others and so God might be calling you to start a life group and you're kind of going, but Chris, like I don't I don't know how to do that. Like, I, I don't know how to, to, to prepare a, a talk, or I, I don't know even where to begin to read, and, and I don't know how to start that. But maybe you're just going to say, you know what, right here and right now, I feel like God's calling me to do that, and so I'm going to make the decision to go when it would be easier to stay. And years later, your story might be, I didn't know what I was doing. And, and maybe there was a lot of times that the people that were with me knew that I didn't know what I was doing. But here's the deal. As a result of being obedient, I am, am now involved in a group of people where we are doing life together and my life is fuller and my life has more meaning and I'm investing in their life and they're investing in my life and our relationship is stronger with God and each other than it ever would have been if I had stayed home. Some of you, maybe it's a ministry. Maybe some of you, God is birthing in you a, a passion to start something, and you're like, I don't know how to do that. I don't even know where to begin, and yet you might just decide right here and right now that I'm going to just take the, take the step of faith, and I'm going to go when it would be easier to stay, and so you might just go home and pull up this little thing called the internet. It's a beautiful tool. And you might just do some searching in the Pittsburgh area of ministries that you want to partner with, that you want to get involved with, and you might just plug in with a ministry. Or you might just say, there isn't anything out there that just kind of jives with what I feel like God is calling me to do, and so I'm just going to start something. And you're going to make the decision to go when it would be easier to stay, and years later, you're going to turn around, you're going to say, look at all the lives that we have been able to influence for the glory of God just because I simply made a decision to go when it would be easier to stay. Some of you, may, maybe, 
Maybe, this, this, this might be stretching it a little bit, but some of you, you might just feel like God calling you to have some more kids. And you have three, but you know how it is. Three is normal, but four is weird, right? But you might just feel like God's calling you to, to have four. Here's what I would say to you. First and foremost, come on over to the weird side, baby. Come on over. It's, it's beautiful on this side of the fence, okay? I'm just telling you. Because we have four, and sometimes we have six, and there are occasions that we have eight. And it's all good, and it's awesome, but you might just say, you know what? I, I wasn't sure about this, but I just believe that children are a gift from God, and so I'm going to have kids, and I'm going to raise those kids in the fear and the admonition of the Lord, and I'm going to disciple them. And years later, you might be able to stand up and say, those kids are changing the world for Jesus Christ because I made a decision decision to go when it would be easier to stay. Some of you might say, well, I don't really want to have any more kids. Well, there's a beautiful thing called adoption or fostering. Maybe you might think about that, and it's not for everyone. Listen, but maybe you feel like God's calling you to do that, but you're kind of going, oh, but Chris, what if it's hard? Well, what if it's difficult? Can I just be honest with you? It's going to be difficult. Especially when you foster. Ta take it from a couple of people who fostered for a long time. And I mean this all seriously. In all seriousness, okay? These kids come with some stories. Th these kids come with some stories that will blow your mind. And it's hard. And it's difficult. And there are a lot of difficult nights. But I'm going to tell you right now. There's something rewarding that happens when you see how the love of Jesus can transform a life. And how a simple hug, a little kiss goodnight, man, I didn't even know what's going on. I didn't even, <sighs> faucets turned over my eyes. When you, <laughs> <laughs> when you see how God can transform a life, and you can see a kid who's hurting and been bruised and doesn't trust anyone turn around and see that there are people who love him. There are people who care for him. And you know that because you've deposited in his life, his life will forever be changed. I'm telling you, it's not always easy. But if God's calling you to do it, you can do all things through Christ who gives you the strength. Some of you guys... I'm gonna change the t I gotta change the tone here because I'm gonna like be a basket case. But some of you, maybe, maybe some of you are single guys. Maybe you're sitting there and you look down the row and there's just that girl, you know. And when she worships Jesus, you're like, oh, praise the Lord, <laughs> you know. You just you just feel the power of the Holy Ghost in your life, but you're afraid to ask her out. Let, let me let me just hook you up, okay? You ready? Here comes the hookup. Go home and brush your teeth. <laughs> okay. Put a little deodorant on, okay? Put a little goop in your hair if you have hair. If you don't, shave it off like me because Josh and I know bald is beautiful, <laughs> right? Okay, come back next week and you ask that girl on a date and I'm gonna throw a little, little prop to my boy Brent. Take, him, take her down to, to Center Avenue Slice, best pizza in town, okay? You take her on a date, you buy her a piece of pizza, and maybe years from now, your story will be this, that there was this time I was sitting in church, and, and I was afraid to go, but that pastor said to go when it would be easier to stay, and so I did what he said, and I asked the girl out, and now we're, now we're married, and now we're having a kid, and we just found out we're having a boy, and we're naming him Chris, because that pastor, <laughs> that pastor got me off my butt and got me some action, and that may not necessarily be spiritual, but it sure is funny. <laughs> See, see, here's what I'm trying to say, okay? Here's the deal. The Bible says, without faith, it is impossible to please God, right? Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And you might ask the question, how did Abram leave where he was and go where God wanted him to go? P put this verse up on the screen, if you would. Hebrews chapter 11, beginning in verse 8, says this, by what? Would you say it with me? By, by faith... Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as, an, as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. How did he do it? Say it again. He went by, by faith. How are you going to do it? 
you're going to go by faith, right? See, I know what some of you are thinking. Oh, but Chris, you don't understand. I don't have the faith to start the journey. Here's the beauty of it. You don't have to have the faith to start. Or you don't have to have the faith to finish. You just have to have the faith to start. Some of you say, I don't have the faith to finish, Chris. I, 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 can't, I can't do it. I don't know. I might fall short. You don't have to have the faith to finish. You just have to have the faith to take the first step and let God do the rest. See, I don't know what it is. I, I don't know how much faith or what faith is going to be required for you to do what God is calling you to do, okay? But I do know this. At the end, we are all going to have one of two stories to tell. Either it's going to be by faith, I believed God, and I decided to go when it was easier to stay, and God used my life in a way that I never thought possible, or by fear, I did nothing. We're either going to have one or two stories to tell. So here's my prayer for you. My prayer is this, that by faith, you would have the courage to make the decision to start whatever it is that you need to start so that you can tell the story that God wants you to tell. My prayer is that by faith, you would have the courage to stop whatever it is that you need to stop that is hindering you from telling the story that God wants you to tell. My prayer is that by faith, you would have the courage to stay when it would be easier to go. When you're thinking, maybe I just walk away from this relationship. Maybe I just walk away from this. But you just have the faith to have the courage to stay when it would be easier to go because God might just call you to grow where you're planted. And then one day, my prayer is this, that as God speaks to you, as he births a calling in your life, by faith, you would have the courage to go when it would be easier to stay. Why? Because the decisions that we make today determine the stories that we will tell tomorrow. And we want to live a story worth telling for the glory of God. So how are we going to do it? We're going to fix our eyes on Jesus the author and the perfecter of our faith who will help us to author the right story. Would you bow your heads with me? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, it is living and it is active and it speaks to our hearts and it speaks to our lives. It challenges us. And so, Lord, I pray today that you would, you, you would take these words, your words, Lord, and you would you would drive them deep into our hearts that we would understand and we would know that you have a plan and a purpose for our lives. You have a plan to prosper us and not to harm us. Plans to give us hope and, and, and a future. And, and so when we understand that, Lord, that there's a comfort, there's, a, there's an assurance in knowing that we can go because you are the one who orders our steps. You are the one who goes before us. You're the one who follows behind us. You, you are with us. That your word says you'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. You'll never turn our ba your back on us. And so e even though there's some trepidation and maybe some fear. And we don't, we don't see the whole picture, Lord. We know that as we begin to take the step of faith, the picture begins to come clear. And you can do amazing. You can do exceedingly abundant above all that we could ever ask, think, or even hope. And so, Lord, I pray that you would, you would speak to us and you would challenge us today, Lord, that we would ask the question, what is it that you want us to want? And then based on that, where do we need to go or what do we need to do so that we can experience what you want us to have, Lord? Because the reality is, and I think I can speak for every single one of us here, we do not want to miss out on a single blessing that you have for us because we responded in fear. We want to respond in faith. We want to respond to you in obedience and trust and allow you to have your way and to do what you desire to do in our lives. Father, I want to pray, though, also for those in this room today that maybe the step that they need to take is the step of accepting you as their Lord and Savior. Maybe for whatever reason, Lord, that they just feel like that they can't have a relationship with you or, or that you couldn't possibly love them. Lord, I pray that you would you would take away that doubt, that you would help them to know the truth, that you love them so much that you were willing to sacrifice your son to make it possible for them to have relationship with you, Lord. There are some in this room today that, that, that their prayer is, I, I want that relationship with God and I don't have one. You know, I want to pause with every head bowed, every eye closed. Maybe that's where you're at today. You say, I, I don't have a relationship with God. 
but I want one. I, I need to know his love. I need to know his grace and his mercy. I want the old to go away. I want the new to come. I don't want to live in regret. I, I, I want my sins to be forgiven. I, I, I want to just know him. I want this gift that you promise of relationship and love. I want to experience that. The Bible says if you confess your sins, he is faithful and he is just and he will forgive you and he will cleanse you from all of your unrighteousness. That, that, that it's not about living up and trying to do the right thing. You can never earn your way to God. Jesus made it possible. He did everything necessary for you to be right with him. And you, you're here today, you say, I want a relationship with God and I don't have one. Would you just slip up your hand if that's you? Anyone in this room to say that's me? Father, we thank you for your great love. And I pray today, God, that you would help us to continue to grow and walk and experience the fullness of that relationship that you desire with us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us to live every day with the reminder that the decisions we make today determine the stories that we tell tomorrow. And so help us, God, to fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. It's in your great name we pray. Amen.